Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Herbert van der Sompel, uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and I'm here with uh, Miel van der Zande from uh, Ghent University, my alma mater, actually. Uh, we've been working on a project uh, to create a linked data archive, uh, more specifically an archive of uh, DBpedia versions, and it uses a couple of interesting, uh, well, re recent uh, technologies uh, to make it all happen. So um, we're going to brief you uh, about, you know, project results. Uh, could be interesting, I think. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, with a little uh, reminder of uh, Memento and how Memento applies to uh, linked data. Then I'll talk a bit about the first generation archive that we had built already in 2010 and why um, that kind of didn't work out anymore, which leads us to the notion of uh, devising uh, affordable and useful linked data archives. This whole notion of um, well, what is affordable to the publisher and yet still uh, of interest to a consumer uh, of an archive, you know, it's kind of finding that balance. Then Middle will introduce uh, two uh, interesting technologies that fit in this discussion, uh, triple pattern fragments and binary representations of RDF. And then we'll talk about the second uh, generation uh, archive that we built. And uh, Mill will then actually give a demo, um, and he insists to do it live. I recommended him not to, but here we are. And then we'll give a couple more pointers. The slides are available in SlideShare, and it's actually a more extensive version of this slide deck that is there with more pointers, uh, what have you. So we start with uh, Memento and linked data. So uh, Memento uh, basically is a time travel for the web. It is a straightforward extension of the HTTP protocol that introduces the notion of daytime negotiation. So basically it is about a client that gets in touch with the resource and it says, I am not interested in what you look like today, I'm interested in what you looked like at some time in the past. And um, in order to make this happen, uh, what you see there is the original resource, that's the one that the client gets in touch with, uh, actually points at another resource, which we call a time gate. And the time gate is a resource that uh, knows about the past of the original resource, so it kind of has a notion of its version history. And once a client is at the time gate, then it can do content negotiation, but in the time dimension and the time gate will redirect uh, the client to an appropriate uh, prior version of the original resource. So what I just explained is a bridge from the present to the past, but Memento also has the inverse. It's a bridge from the past to the present. So really, th this allows one to go back and forth between the present and the past of the web vice versa. Memento was introduced uh, somewhere in 2009, and already in 2010 we understood that it was of, of real interest to linked data to apply Memento principles to linked data. So we had this paper at the linked data uh, for the Open Web uh, conference, in which we showed how to, th this principle that I just explained, this time negotiation, how you could uh, implement it for uh, linked data. And so what you see on top there is your typical uh, linked data environment with at the left-hand side the, what they call the non-information resource. It's a resource with the URI that re represents the abstract concept, uh, for example, of the city of Paris or so. And typically in uh, linked data implementations, from that resource you get redirected to the resource that describes uh, that concept. So that's called the information resource and that's where you find the representation. So since Memento is all about representations, one actually uh, hangs the time gate link of the information resource to go to the time gate. And so once the client is there at the time gate again, it can now just negotiate for a past version of a linked data description. Okay? That's, that's basically uh, the, the setup. So it's, it's the same as with the regular web. The only difference here is that one applies it to the information resource, not to the non-information resource. In that same paper, we showed uh, the power uh, of this uh, capability. And uh, what you see here is a graph that was automatically created purely by doing daytime negotiation with these resources. So the resources that were used were those uh, representing uh, different countries in DBpedia, and they were each uh, negotiated for different moments in time. 
and out of the descriptions that came back, one uh, attribute, one property was collected, namely gross domestic uh, product per capita for that country. And so basically, by just doing this for different versions of uh, DBpedia descriptions, you could make this plot. So we thought that was pretty powerful. And that's also why we decided to start promoting these concepts within uh, the linked data community. You know, so beyond the web archiving community, but also uh, in the linked data community. And that's why we built uh, a DBpedia archive. Uh, basically, I'll outline a bit how uh, we went about that. So uh, the DBpedia uh, dumps are available for download. So you basically download them and you upload them into an archive to make it usable. What we did in the first generation is we used MongoDB to stuff all of that in there. Uh, so basically what you have there is one blob in MongoDB per uh, topic URI, so subject URI, like the city of Paris, again, right, and per timestamp, okay? So you have one blob and it all goes uh, into uh, this one archive. <clears throat> um, the upload software for that was custom. Uh, when we came to the more recent versions of DBpedia, it took us about 24 hours to upload the version because the whole index structure had to be recreated in the setup that we had done there. Uh, it took us uh, about 400 gigabytes to store uh, 10 versions uh, of it. And we only load the 10 versions uh, because at one point, basically, this architecture uh, wouldn't scale up anymore. Uh, we, we just couldn't uh, add further information. So from an access, that was the storage perspective. From the access perspective, uh, basically the current version of DBpedia provided this time gate link to our archive. And then basically a client was able to negotiate in time with subject URIs of DBpedia topics. So again, the city of Paris, the United States, et cetera, et cetera. So only uh, subject URI uh, access. And these are the kind of pages, uh, obviously also available in other serializations, uh, RDF uh, serializations, that would come back from uh, the archive. Looks very much to what DBP itself serves, only its prior versions, okay? So the TimeGate software that we used for that, basically that provides access subject to URI daytime, right? Uh, that was also custom created access only uh, on subject URI, and there was an integration with the current version of DBpedia by the creation of this TimeGate link. So the people at DBpedia actually provided that link to our uh, archive. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, only subject URI access, and then because uh, of the way we'd been storing this in MongoDB, uh, basically it was not a scalable uh, solution, and we were not able to load uh, version 2.9 in 2013 anymore. So the archive has basically been frozen uh, since then. We haven't loaded 2014, 2015 uh, in this uh, architecture. So because we're really uh, convinced that this is a cool thing to have for the linked data community, uh, we sit, set out to really reflect on, so how should we do this in a way that is actually sustainable for ourselves, you know, publishing this archive and also still useful uh, for the client. This leads us to the notion of you know, affordable and uh, useful uh, linked data archives. So where is this balance between what is affordable for the publisher, the archive, and still useful for the customer? And I'm going to do a non-scientific evaluation of a couple of uh, criteria. The people in Ghent actually have written papers about the stuff that I will be talking about, but we can't go into these kind of details. But I'll, I'll go over a couple of characteristics uh, of typical uh, solutions. Uh, for example, availability of a solution. You know, is it a high, highly available solution or is it complicated to run it, hence less available? What is the bandwidth required you know, to access the solution or to provide it? What is the cost for the publisher and the consumer? And then a couple of things that relate to the functionality for the client specifically. So what is the expressiveness of the interface? Like for the previous archive that we had, it's only subject URI access. But you could think of an archive that supports Sparkle queries, right? Uh, so that's what I mean with expressiveness. Is it integrated with the linked open data cloud in general? So meaning, can I follow my nose? Can I implement Memento support for it? And something that I 
think is very important, goes back to that chart I showed you, this notion of being able to walk across time and across data sets. Can I actually implement it with this kind of a setup? So the first one, I'll do the subject URI because that's uh, the one that we implemented. Availability, rather high because you can use pretty simple technologies to implement subject URI access. We used MongoDB, probably not the smartest choice. We could have used ARC files or WARC files. You know, th there are simpler technologies that we can use. So availability can be rather high, both for publisher and consumer, obviously. The bandwidth required is proportional in this case to the size of a description. These things are typically not big, uh, your typical linked data description. The cost for a publisher in this kind of solution can be relatively low, again, because it's a simple uh, solution. But at the consumer end, and this is where you start seeing this balance, it's high because in order for a client to really resolve a query, it has to collect an awful lot of linked data descriptions and may actually not even be able to collect them all in order to resolve its query. So it kind of really is more favorable for the publisher here than for uh, the consumer. Interface expressiveness relates directly to what I said, rather low. Load integration, obviously, because one moves from one URI to another, just following uh, your nose. Memento support possible because we did it. And again, same thing, cross time and data. You can do it because you're just following your nose from one data set to another or from one time frame to another. So it's, it's totally positive. The verdict on this, uh, Clearly not too expensive from a publication perspective, but not very high functionality at all for your client. If you step over to another typical way of publishing linked data, which is by means of dumps. So as I mentioned, DBpedia is available as a data dump also. Now, this is of course from the publisher perspective extremely cheap extremely high availability, you just put the file out there, right? And people have to come and download it. Uh, from the perspective of the consumer, of course, also high availability, but now, you know, the cost for your client is really high because it needs to get this entire data set, which if you're going to work with DBP, for example, that's very significant, right? You have to download it, store it in a queryable environment, so you're looking at significant cost. Uh, in a dump, obviously, you have no linked data support. This is just uh, a dump. You cannot implement a Memento. And when you want to do cross time and cross data, well, basically, you need to download all these different data sets you know, in order to be able to traverse them in your uh, local environment. So this is not a very favorable. It's very cheap, of course, from the perspective of the publisher, but not very useful for a client, uh, in my opinion. Could be, you know, for an archive, maybe it's an okay approach, but still, maybe we can do better than this. Then, of course, I mean, Sparkle is another way that, you know, uh, linked data is accessed uh, very frequently. And again, the people have done a lot of work uh, with regard to looking into availability of public Sparkle endpoints, and it's really problematic. I mean, this is, you just got to think no one in the past would have thought of putting their SQL database out there and for anyone to query. That's basically what we're talking about. You put the Sparkle endpoint out there, and now every crazy can come in and, you know, ask questions whichever query. So that's going to be problematic. That results in low availability of these public uh, Sparkle endpoints. Uh, the bandwidth is proportional to the query. Some queries result in the little uh, data, others uh, in an awful lot. The cost here, again, this relates to the technology that you're going to use. At the level of the publisher, it's really high because you have to maintain, keep that Sparkle endpoint operational. At the end of the consumer, it's low because you can do a really expressive query and only get back exactly what you want, right? So it's, it's a good deal for the client. Interface, extremely expressive. No linked data integration, or to an extent, you know, for Sparkle queries that can be expressed uh, as HTTP GET URIs. Memento support would be really hard, uh, actually. Again, for certain uh, queries, you could do it. And this cross time and data thing, it's possible, but typically would involve distributed Sparkle queries, which is a research topic in its own right. You know, I keep reading papers about that and reviewing them. I, th I think it's, it's a messy kind of world. Uh, so from a publication perspective, 
extremely expensive. From an access perspective, interesting, because you can formulate really uh, expressive queries. But then again, there's a couple of other things that are not really readily available, like memento support, not straightforward, lot integration, uh, and so on. So this is an overview of this admittedly non-scientific uh, evaluation that I've done. When you compare these three kind of ways of making linked data archives available, so the technologies that you can use, again, data dump, Sparkle endpoint, subject URI access. You see that I left a row open. That's, of course, for the solution that's going to be really great, okay? And uh, I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Mil, because he's going to introduce two technologies that are actually, from an archival perspective, access to linked data really interesting. All right, hi. Um, so I will just uh, go straight into it. Um, so basically, uh, what Herbert said is exactly what uh, caused us to do this kind of research. Um, so we noticed that there was a lack of queryable linked data on the web, which was usually because, uh, or they don't want to host a public Sparkle endpoint, and if they did, then it had availability problems. So most of the people just stuck to putting RDF files as data dumps online which was also not really linked data and not uh, really what we wanted. So we were wondering why does nobody explore the access between these two, right? I mean, there are REST APIs, we have been working with all sorts of web data access in the past, so why can't we apply these things properly uh, to linked data? Um, so that's where we came up with this, uh, calling this access um, linked data fragments, right? So all possible interfaces to linked data return you some kind of fragment in some way or another. So you could say that a Sparkle endpoint returns you query results, uh, a data jump just gives you all the data, but they're all fragments in some way. Um, so we started with this conceptual framework where we could do and uh, research in and try to find new trade-offs between um, the interface and what the client has to do. Um, and so we have three main characteristics that define a fragment, which is the selector. What kind of questions can I ask my interface? Is it a Sparkle query? Is it a file name? Is it a subject URI? A second, what are the controls? You know, how can I, when I query this interface, how can I find more fragments? How can I find more data that is related? Um, which is uh, very um, like a REST API, for example, which just uses hypermedia to uh, navigate you to other um, questions. And then metadata, what is helpful for the client? What kind of information can I um, supply with my fragment to help the um, client to fulfill its task? And so um, the important thing about this is that Every interface, every linked data fragment interface comes with a certain trade-offs. You can't have it all. You can't, uh, there's no magic bullet here. It's just uh, a matter of finding the tipping point in where um, can I uh, restrict my server in a way so it's for me easy to put, put up linked data without um, coming into danger of availability problems and so on. Um, but on the other hand, the clients can still do the tasks like they are used to, right? And so, um, as a first instance of such a linked data fragments interface, we came up with triple pattern fragments. So, tech, uh, so um, in general, we just said, okay, what if we just restrict the interface to subject, predicate, object, uh, triple pattern matches, right? So. Uh, for those who are not familiar with RDF, subject predicate object is basically what uh, RDF data is expressed in. And so we just um, allow you to uh, put a variable for each of these um, three terms. And so this becomes very uh, interesting for archives or basically anybody who wants to publish linked data because we're trying to move the complexity a bit to the client because it's in fact the client 
who wants the task done, who wants to solve the query. So why should the server do all the work, right? Uh, and especially for archives, dealing with certain versions, a lot of data, a lot of versions of the same data set, um, it becomes more and more complex. So we're trying to divide a bit uh, the load. So um, specifically for uh, triple pattern fragments, uh, the selector, like I just uh, said for linked data fragments, is subject, predicate, object. Um, the controls uh, give you uh, information um, to be able to find other fragments. So you can automatically navigate to the next pages. You can automatically uh, formulate new triple patterns. Uh, and we use a Hydra vocabulary, which is um, because it's important to note that this is a machine interface, right? So we self-describe our uh, API so the machine is able to automatically figure out how to ask for new triple patterns to our interface. For us, it, uh, humans, it's easy, right? We present an HTML page, we know where to click, we know what uh, HTML forms uh, to complete. Um, this is the same thing, but it is uh, machine interpretable, right? So this is the, uh, some sort of control metadata. Um, the Hydra vocabulary is, by the way, it's a W3C community uh, group, um, which tries to do uh, cell descriptive APIs. Very interesting. Uh, and then we also supply some metadata, which the most important part is actually the estimated counts that we give, um, so querying clients can do some optimization, right? They can do some selectivity estimation and which triple patterns to ask first and so on. But this, I will clarify this in the demo. All right, um, so of course this interface is just, it's an API, right? Um, we still need a data source uh, that um, confines all our triples and it's easily, um, I can supply the data for our API. So that's uh, why we stumbled upon um, HDT. HDT uh, stands for Header Dictionary Triples. And it's actually, um, it was a submission a while back and um, it's still hanging there. It's um, some sort of uh, research outcome from a group in Madrid. Um, but it's actually very interesting because it's a compressed file format for RDF, but it's, it's like a zip file, but it's not only a zip file, it's also indexed in a way that you can ask simple queries. Um, so, like I said, it just, um, you put in an RDF file, it just compresses the whole thing, it indexes it in certain ways, um, and it generates some metadata, and then you can uh, use that as a single file and ask queries. And so the interesting thing for us was um, this was like a match made in heaven because um, their triple pattern access was actually really fast um, and they're also able to count the amount of matches really, really fast. Um, so that's why um, now all the services that we run have an HTT backend a uh, server um, that is exposed through a triple pattern fragments API. Um, all right, back to you. Yes, I'll do that one. So as Mil says, this combination of uh, triple pattern fragments, so the, the notion of being able to query subject, predicate, object uh, patterns, and HGT storage, that's truly a uh, marriage made in heaven. Because in the end, HGT is just a static file. There's no moving parts to it. It's just a binary thing that sits there and is self-contained with its own indexes on these three uh, uh, dimensions. So again, when we look back at our characteristics here, you can have very high availability. Again, it's just sitting there. It's just a file uh, that sits there with, uh, with its access points. Uh, bandwidth, again, proportional to the query. 
you know, and the cost very low uh, at the end of a publisher, so very attractive for the publisher. And for the consumer, well, medium in the sense that it may actually have to issue uh, multiple queries in order to resolve what it really wants to do. And I think uh, Mil will uh, demo how that uh, can function. But the thing is that rather uh, complex uh, Sparkle queries can really be dealt with in this way just by using these uh, triple patterns. So it's uh, really interesting. So interface expressiveness, clearly better than subject URI only. And well, not as good as Sparkle, but then again, it's affordable for the publisher, right? So again, we, we're working on this balance here. Load integration, of course, possible. It's just uh, URIs. Memento support, absolutely possible. And cross time and data, possible because you know multiple data sets can have the same interfaces, and you can have different versions of the same data set with exactly these interfaces. And again, uh, Mil uh, will demo that. So this is. From an archival perspective, extremely attractive in my opinion, uh, very cheap for the publisher, and really still valuable uh, for a client. So that's what we did uh, for our new DBpedia archive. So we got rid of the MongoDB solution, and now have built these solutions using AGT files and the subject predicate object uh, pattern uh, access. So, what we do, uh, so this is the, the storage approach here. Uh, we take each of the DBP, the dumps, and for each we create one of these AGT files. So you may remember the first picture with MongoDB where everything had to go in one data storage, where we don't have that situation here. Each of these DBP files gets translated in a binary HDT file. So it's very scalable uh, as a, a proposition. <clears throat> there is software for that. Uh, HDT C++ is uh, what we used. Uh, upload time, on average, uh, about four hours, meaning the conversion from uh, the DBP, the dump, to the HDT uh, version. Some of these DBP versions, the recent ones, are massive. So four hours is actually a really good deal. Uh, remember that when we tried to upload the latest version in Mongo, it took us a day, and we weren't even successful. So storage I talked about. Here we have 70 giga only, so that says something about the compression rate. We had 400 giga for 10 versions, and that didn't include the recent ones that are massive. Okay, so here we have only 70 gig for all the versions basically uh, up until now. And that is in total 5 billion uh, triples that are accessible uh, in this way, or stored in this way. This is the access pattern. So once we have these uh, DBpedia HDT uh, files, we then introduce the linked data fragment server from Ghent University, which for the purpose of this project was extended with Memento TimeGate functionality. So basically now uh, what happens is a client goes to DBpedia, finds a TimeGate link there, to this uh, Memento time gate in the linked data fragment server, and then can start to daytime negotiation, but over these subject predicate object patterns. It's extremely powerful, right? It's just not only subject to your eye, it's now these queries that you can resolve uh, subject to time. So, well, Mil will uh, demo this, I don't really need to show you that. Uh, in the slides that are on SlideShare, you will find all the base URIs of all these things, so you can try this at home. Uh, you can use Memento for Chrome uh, to navigate this, or obviously you can do it at the prompt using curl uh, or so. And in addition to uh, providing the subject predicate object access, we also still support subject uh, URI access for backwards compatibility, and that's basically just using a proxy, right, that, that uses the linked data fragment uh, time gate uh, itself. So here, um, the time gate software is actually directly implemented in the linked data fragment server. So if you download uh, the new version of that software, it actually comes with uh, Memento on board. Two types of access, the triple pattern fragment and the subject URI and uh, date, both with date, of course. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. And then I'm going to hand over um, to Mil for the little <laughs> demo. All right, you know all the stories about live demos, right? This is not like that. It will work. Okay, so uh, can everybody see that okay? 
So this is fragments.dbpedia.org. So this is the official DBpedia triple pattern fragments um, interface. Uh, so this is the home page. Um, so what we what we typically um, host at this uh, endpoint is basically the latest version and maybe the 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 uh, previous version, but it's definitely not an archive, it's just to supply always the most recent version of um, DBpedia. That's of course where um, the, um, the other archive comes in. Um, and so um, I will dive right into it. So this is how um, a triple pattern fragments um, interface looks like, or at least how it looks like in HTML. Of course it has um, the RDF, um, content negotiation as well. And this is what actually what the client applications use. Uh, and so as you can see, you can just um, do all sorts of browsing uh, by using um, just triple patterns um, that you can use. And here you can see what the metadata looks like. So here it says, okay, this triple pattern has two triples. Um, it has 100 triples a page and it has um, just one page because there are only two. Um, so I can just keep on going uh, like this. Um, but the interesting part is, of course, what can we do with this? Um, so we actually built this um, query client um, that uses this interface to be able to uh, resolve real Sparkle queries that you were supposed to send to a server and get back an answer. And now it's actually your client um, that solves the query. So let me click this. All right, so we, you see here that DBpedia 2015, which is uh, just the URI that I just showed you. Um, and this is a query, uh, for example, that looks for all movies um, and the directors of all movies where Brad Pitt uh, played in. Um, and so this is just, um, this client was developed in JavaScript. It just runs in the browser. There's no server-side magic um, to it. And so when I run this, uh, you can see that, I mean, query times are still fairly uh, fast, depending on the query, of course. Um, but especially for the server, this is really easy to, to answer because the computational resources are way easier to predict when you just have these triple patterns than when you have to um, handle the whole expressiveness of Sparkle. Um, and here uh, at the bottom, you can see that it just requested a lot of these fragments just to be able to come up with the answer. Um, of course, this client is always under development. There's query execution research going on, trying to optimize this um, process. Um, so, what about uh, the memento aspect? So let me get back to my um, my original resource, um, my uh, fragment. I will ask for uh, triples that have uh, something to do with Paris. And now I can use uh, the Memento plugin for Chrome. It's fairly small, but you can see it uh, in the right uh, top. And there I can set a date, for example, I can bring you to 2010 and see what happens on January 2010, how this page used to look like. So if I now use my plugin, I can say get near the save date. And then uh, we'll start navigating. So what happens is actually now it's negotiation. It followed the link to the time gate, negotiated about the date. Uh, and now you can see that I left fragments.tbpedia.org and I'm now in fragments.mementodepot.org. Um, so this is completely different location, but because of Memento, you can just automatically navigate uh, to the right version. And so I can use this as, a, as any normal uh, TPF server. I can just stay in this um, version if I want. Um, 
And I can also just navigate back if I say get near current date. Um, you will see that it will bring me to the memento that um, represents my most recent um, version. All right. Now then, now for the magic. Um, so I tried to um, uh, also implement this memento feature uh, using the Sparkle queries, which was a success. Um, and so let me just demonstrate um, how what this means for uh, executing Sparkle queries. Um, so let me see if I can. All right, so I created this query. Uh, it's a Sparkle query, don't be scared. It's not, um, it's quite easy actually. Um, what this does is this, it looks for all the albums that were, were recorded in San Antonio, just gets the label and um, the record date and the artist and then gets the label of that artist. Uh, the reason why this is double is because DBpedia changed their schema somewhere in the middle and if I would where to query old versions, it wouldn't give me any results because it doesn't know that schema. Um, so this is the query, and then I have the same client as you saw in the browser. I just have it um, in a Node.js version. It's just the same thing. It just works on my desktop instead. Um, I wanted to do it in a browser, but I had this whole cross-origin issue and, you know, didn't work in time. But so um, this is how I, can you see that? It's like all the way at the top, right? That's a shame. I will do this and then I will do this. Okay, so n now I just, it's just a command uh, line client. So here you can see um, that I'm trying to query uh, fragments.tbpedia.org, so I'm not going to the archive, I'm just going to that one. Uh, the query file, then just some output parameters. Um, and so if I run this query like this, uh, you can see that it comes up with the results. Oh, Black Sabbath was here. And um, so if I run this query again, but now I add a date time, which is 2012, but same URI, you can see that I will get different results because this is what the data used to give me uh, in 2012. And you can actually see that um, in this uh, one, there was a recording in November 2012, which is obviously not uh, in here, but it's also fun to see that there was actually data that disappeared over time. Um, okay, I think that's um, it for now. Let me get back to the slides. All right, so um, as a last thing, um, the important thing here is that um, as long as publishing linked data stays hard and it becomes uh, too expensive and so on, we won't be able to do this whole linked data metadata thing uh, in the end. So the important thing here is that you can really try this at home. It's a fairly um, easy and cheap uh, way to publish linked data uh, and now I will just shortly show you the steps of how you just set up your own um, interface. So typically you just take your RDF files, you put them into an HTT file uh, using um, a C++ application. This, was, this is research code, there's still a lot of issues in it, it works, but you have to be careful. Um, we're still looking for people who want to contribute, making the software better because it's really really great, um, but we noticed that um, it doesn't work well with uh, 
or do you have data that isn't cleaned in advance? So a lot of manual cleaning, make sure the URIs are, are encoded properly and so on. Um, that's also why some DBpedia versions were not um, completed in time. Um, and yeah, it, it still needs some work and it, uh, the code could give you a lot more feedback than it does now. Uh, and it's also very memory intensive because it, it really compresses really well, but for, in order to do that, it needs uh, all the information uh, in memory at the moment. Uh, I know the guys that do this, they're working on a MapReduce implementation that is supposed to solve most of these issues. Um, but again, it's research work, so uh, production value is still um, early. Uh, there's also a Java version um, for those who want. Uh, but in general, it's really easy. It's a single command saying RDF to HGT, and it just starts rolling. Second, uh, download the triple pattern fragments uh, code. Uh, actually, this is uh, more than a triple pattern fragment server. It's a whole linked data fragment server. So we add plugins and modules whenever we can, um, like, for example, the Memento support. Uh, we have, um, it's a Node.js server. We also have one in Java. We have also have one in Python, I think. There, we have some third-party implementations as well. But this is definitely the most mature server. So um, I would advise you to try that one first. Uh, so we have support for all sorts of data sources. Uh, HDT is recommended. But if you want, if your data is small, you can just put up turtle files of keep something in memory, or even use a Sparkle endpoint if you want. Uh, and somebody also um, for the Java server added some Blaze Graph support, which is a, a high-end triple store, um, but I haven't tested that yet. And then version two was just released, like Herbert said. Uh, it had some breaking changes because the Hydra vocabulary changed. Um, and then step three is just configure your server. It's just um, composing a JSON file saying, uh, these are my data sources, these are the mementos, these are the time ranges that they are um, valid in, um, add some time gates, um, connect them with the, with the mementos that you want them to navigate to, and so on. You can, by the way, all this is in more in detail in the uh, repositories on GitHub, on the readmes, and so on. So I will just not go into it right now. And then all you need to do is just um, start your server with a single command. And um, basically, that's this. That's it. Um, yeah, we usually don't need more than uh, half a day or something to start something up. Um, if the, the most time is uh, generating the HTT, once that's done, um, it's basically half an hour or something. Um, and it does scale because we have this Amsterdam project that hosts like 640 billion triples or something, and they all do it uh, in this way, which I haven't seen any Sparkle endpoint do yet. So that's it for us. Um, I think we have time for questions, right? Yeah, are there any questions? Yeah. So how are uh, Sparkle queries translated into those queries? Uh, so that's with the query algorithm. It just finds out how to split the um, the, the complex query in a sim more simpler queries. Um, and it uses the count metadata that I um, briefly mentioned to optimize this process. Um, and we're also experimenting with which metadata can we still add, which uh, changes can we make uh, to m make the queries go faster. Uh, not the server, the client does this, yeah. So all the server does is answer triple patterns. It doesn't do anything else. Yeah. Um, we try to, yeah. 
Um, it is, in theory it is, some things like uh, optional, um, distinct, well not distinct, well distinct as well, I mean some, some things are just hard, um, that go really, really slow, they work, but they go really, really slow, and, but then again, most of these things I, are weird that they're in Sparkle in the first place, because they're so specific and so database-y. I don't know how they were planning to make this work on the web. Really slow, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, like counting, for example. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there are two servers that do that. So for first of all, the node server, um, because that's the one who returns the data. Uh, and of course, there's an HTTP cache in front. So there's an Nginx server who basically is able to reuse most of the fragments, um, especially when you have multiple clients querying. Um, because of the granularity, it's better for caching in general than Sparkle query, which is always different. Yeah, I, I mean, in general, all requests are really small, so um, it's not that big of an issue. Um, but we're still looking at getting this bandwidth down more and more and more. Any other questions? I'm still curious about the client that converts the Sparkle to mm -hmm. fragments. Um, is that a package that is available? Uh, yes. Um, some people voluntarily started doing things in Python and things in Perl and um, but ours is Node.js and it's freely available, it's MIT license. Um, it's in GitHub, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can compile it for the browser which is what you saw. Um, I mean you, do, you technically you don't really need to have it, you can just go to client.linkdatafragments.org which is what I demoed it's just you open up the browser and you can start querying interfaces from there as well. I mean, they're totally separate. So. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for attending this session. Thank Thanks. you.